one of the most important franchises ever created. DMC's satisfying combat, style ranking system, and enemy variety makes it one of the best action franchises ever made, while combining it with a deep and heartfelt story about the true meaning of family. Ever since the original that came out in 2001, DMC earned its own genre effectively named after it, known as character action games. Games that are focused around efficient, stylish play, along with multiple characters to play as, unique environments, and difficulty. There are many games to list that are under the character action game umbrella, and the focus of today's video is a little gem for the PS2 released in 2005, known as the Sword of Ateria. The Sword of Ateria, or Oz in Japan, or Chains of Power in Korea, is a third-person hack-and-slash developed and published by Konami in 2005, it made its way over to the EU in early 2006. Konami was pretty much looking to compete in some way with Devil May Cry. Many of the higher-ups who worked on the Sword of Ateria had also previously worked on some of the Castlevania and Suicoden series, and ended up bringing in references into Sword of Ateria itself. However, that's literally everything we got on the history of this game. I only know about it myself due to a video that Sivit released on the game. And after seeing gameplay captivate me, I decided to give it a try and see if I could scratch that itch that DMC has left for a while. The Sword of Ateria begins in an odd setting, dropping us right into a place with no introduction, no build-up, and being introduced to three characters with a familiarity that they've known each other for a long time. Almira, Leon, and Kane are the members of a group called Oz, which we later learn stands for Over Zenith, acting as enforcers of the gods in this world. After getting brought into a tutorial battle, being introduced to the basics of combat, we continue on with the story, having a strange event trigger in the world, where our heroes are suddenly powered down and forced to say goodbye to Cain, as something unknown takes him away. After an unknown amount of time has passed, we are now brought to a time much later on, where the gods seem to be ordering an attack on a village of ordinary humans, and we meet our main protagonist, Feel. After defending his village from a mind-controlled Almira and eventually Leon, the three go and move to rescue Feel's little sister, Dorothy, from the god's envoys, encountering new members of Oz along the way, and maybe learning some things about the world and Feel's past. This is about all I can really get into before bringing up spoilers, and since this game's story gets kinda crazy with its reveals later on, I don't really want to rob anyone of some of the stuff that happens in it. The most I will say is that you shouldn't take it seriously and don't expect anything mind-blowing, but it is entertaining, and it is worth playing through to experience. Part of its enjoyment, though, is the inspiration, an out-of-pocket reference to The Wizard of Oz. Yes, you heard me right. Konami took inspiration from The Wizard of Oz and mashed it up with a combat system that is also inspired by Devil May Cry, and made this game. The main characters are a direct analog to one from the movie, with Feel representing the Tin Man, Almira representing the Scarecrow, and Leon representing the Scared Lion. Well, okay, it's, they're technically opposites. Instead of Leon being extremely cowardly, he's instead brash and headstrong, always looking for trouble and always looking for a good fight. Almira is incredibly smart, and is usually right when it comes to her theories, having a lot of knowledge on the world and topics related to the game unlike the Scarecrow in the movie, who claims to not have a brain. Feel, being an analog to the Tin Man, means that instead of not having a heart and seemingly not acting on emotion, Feel is open about his determination to rescue his sister, Dorothy. And while I brought up Dorothy, yeah, Feel's little sister is straight up Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. Name, appearance, everything. Same goes for your magical cat that happens to transform into Feel's axe. His name is Toto. I think you get the idea when it comes to the inspirations by this point. Konami took these characters and archetypes and put them in a story that involves the basic plot thread of the gods are evil, manipulative, and corrupt, and we must kill them. While I'm still praising the game, I want to get arguably the best aspect of the Sword of Ateria out of the way, because this game exemplifies a belief that I think everyone should understand. Art design is more important than graphics. For a game released in 2005, even on the aging PS2, this game looks straight up hideous. 
character models are low textured, environments are basic and bare bones, and there's a lack of polish in many areas of presentation. But looking past the basic stuff, and looking at the aesthetics of this game, it's some of the most striking stuff you will ever see. The character designs in this game are so damn cool. Not one or two, all of them. And when the characters get to equip their armor, oh man, that is some epic looking shit. The sprites during dialogue are extremely well done and surprisingly expressive. Chapter intros have these awesome looking title cards. Pre-rendered cutscenes are striking and a little unsettling too. They're quick with their camera cuts and visuals, leading to a very moody atmosphere while watching. Voice acting is great across the board as well, with quite a few recognizable VAs brought on to the project, including Johnny Young Bosch, Wendy Lee, Crispin Freeman, Steve Bloom, and Michelle Ruff. And then there's the music. Oh my god, the music. The Sword of Atarius tracklist kind of has a little bit of everything, getting you hyped with certain tracks while also being melancholic or setting the mood correctly. It's got a bit of everything, and part of that is why the tracklist is so enjoyable. Even if a few tracks repeat a few too many times in the game for my liking. While discussing more interesting and creative things, one of the other good aspects of this game is the combat. When I said the Sword of Ateria is similar to Devil May Cry, I wasn't kidding, since a good portion of Feel's attacks feel like something Dante would use in DMC. Instead of a traditional singular character going after hordes of enemies to progress through the stages, Sword of Ateria has a party system as well as a juggling system, known as linking. After comboing an enemy enough, stars form on the top of enemies' heads, which is the visual indicator to launch the enemy using one of the two finisher moves. A stinger slash streak type attack, which launches your enemy forward, or a high time attack that launches the enemy into the air. You can also finish your whole basic 7 hit combo and launch enemies that way as well, but it's not the preferred way to go about things. Once the enemy is airborne, you and your friends proceed to play fucking volleyball with the enemies. Whoever launches the enemy will then call out to the party member closest to them to come over and continue the volley, sending it around and taking turns. If, say, Feel launched an enemy into the air and Almira was close by, she'd swoop in, hit the enemy, and then launch him over to Leon, who would then launch the enemy back to Feel, and so on and so forth until the enemy dies. Launching enemies is the bread and butter of this game's combat system since it enables access to the meter on the right side of the screen, enabling Feel and the party to use special moves. The meter steadily fills up depending on the amount of attacks hit on an airborne enemy. Once you reach a certain threshold, you'll extend the meter and get access to one of three moves. Level 1 is simply Feel's basic AoE spin attack, followed by a ground fissure, enabling a modicum of crowd control and single target damage. Level 2, by contrast, is a pair-up attack with either Almira or Leon though I'm not sure what determines who gets priority. Almira's attack is a shower of energy shards, while Leon's is a charging forward attack. Both have their uses, but ultimately Leon's is generally better since it has high damage and is easily able to weaken large enemies' guards and is even capable of launching other enemies into the air as well. Almira's can do this too, but its damage is significantly less, making it not as viable. 
Finally, level 3 is a full team attack called Over Zenith, which is easily the most satisfying thing to do in the game full stop. And once you master how the combat system works, you'll be getting level 2 and level 3 attacks frequently, and somehow it never gets old. Son, yeah, here we go! Sadly, the game never reached its full potential in the gameplay department since there are plenty of decisions made both with the players and the enemies that make the combat quite frustrating at times. Starting off with just feels issues, he isn't exactly the most enjoyable protagonist to play as. His moveset is very limited, with only one combo, two launchers, one air combo, and one special attack. The worst part is that every other character has this same problem, with one combo, two launchers, one air combo, and one special attack. I wish that you could either purchase more moves with the Terria in the main menu, or just have access to more combos and launchers, because as it stands in the game right now, it's a very basic system and can get very repetitive, which is not something you want in a game whose combat system is inspired by Devil May Cry. Your movement is also very stiff. Now normally I wouldn't complain about this too much, but the real problem with the game's combat system to me is the long delay between some animations. When finishing up Feel's attacks, or anyone's attacks now that I think about it, they'll take their sweet time getting back into their default animation and combat stances leaving you wide open for attacks from the enemies. There is a tutorial that's unlocked after beating Chapter 4 that teaches you the only tech, that I've found at least, that this game has to offer, which is animation cancelling. This is nice, but the fact that this mechanic isn't taught to you forcefully by the game is very frustrating, since it's the only way to realistically speed up combat. Feel. Your axe isn't that heavy. Pick it up off the ground and get back into the fight faster, please. What's even worse is that this one piece of tech isn't even universal throughout all of the character's moves, only some of them. What's even more unfortunate is that due to your limited moveset and movement mechanics, it's difficult to follow up on Almira or Leon's juggles. In my experience, you either need to position yourself before they attack, taking into account where your friends will launch the enemy, then time your slow-ass swings accordingly, or just straight up YOLO it at times because sometimes that strategy works just to keep the combo going. The game's lock-on, while nice to have, oftentimes locks you onto someone that you did not want to lock onto, including enemies that are much further away than the one that you're hoping to deal with, which then messes up your positioning and can lead to you taking damage. You'll notice quickly early on that every character in the game has their attacks fail to hit enemies who are on the ground. Your attacks will straight up whiff enemies if they're lying on the ground like a dead fish and or in their getup animation. All the while, you can get comboed by the enemies and bosses like it's nothing, which is something that really fucking bothers me. This doesn't feel fair, sort of Ateria. One of the biggest frustrations I had throughout my playthrough is that three of the game's best and most important mechanics, level 3 over Zenith, Blue Ateria, and the ability to play as other characters are straight up locked off from you until you reach certain points in the game. Not being able to play as Almira or Leon, I understand. But until you complete Chapter 12, over Zenith Level 3 and the transformation into your sort of Devil Trigger being locked off from you is frustrating, since not only are these two things incredibly useful and would have been nice to have prior to this chapter's completion, but it also gives you what feels like limited time to really play around with these new mechanics. Level 3 over Zenith is an oddity on your first playthrough, basically requiring luck to pull off. Unless if you equip accessories that increase the meter faster, it's honestly a bit of a frustrating endeavor to get it. Same with the transformation, which only triggers during boss fights and if you filled up the Oz gauge on the HUD. Said blue Ateria is only gained through killing enemies with special attacks, and the most amount gained is through level 3 over Zenith. I think you can see the disconnect there. On top of the combat issues I mentioned, I do have some gripes about how the game's progression works. Not the mechanics, but how you level up your characters. Each member has three stats to level up. Health, damage, and accessory slots. With the rest of the items you can purchase being accessories that either help or hinder the party. 
Unfortunately, the amount of currency you actually acquire throughout the game and at the end of missions is not enough to keep up. Prices double and double again rapidly, and it feels like you need to grind forever to get it, or play old missions in bonus mode to get the Ataria needed. Now, that's pretty much all of the gameplay gripes I have that I got out of the way. Most of the combat I've already delved into, and while I do have a few more things I can groan about, part of its annoyances is due to my skill at this game being a little low par. What there is to discuss is the game's extra content. This is where I'm going to be getting into spoilers. I won't be discussing the game's story that much, since there honestly isn't much to say about the narrative, other than the various endings you can get, which are tied to your overall ranking at the end. Where if you get a C or below, you get the bad ending, B gets you the normal ending, A gets you the good ending, and A with certain specific conditions fulfilled gets you the true ending. However, the journey that you take to get to the ending is far more interesting. The game has branching paths that will actually change depending on what happens during certain gameplay segments and dialogue choices. The game has an affinity system that it doesn't fucking tell you about, where you can raise your affinity with Almira and Leon depending on what you direct feel to say. As a result, after the party gets separated at the end of Chapter 8, depending on who you decided to basically praise the most, they will end up with feel first. But that's not all. In Chapter 9, you'll meet up with either Juju or Gollum depending on who you beat first in the dual battle in Chapter 6. In my case, I beat Juju first, so once I got to Chapter 7, I then had to fight Gollum, and break the god's control over him. Once that happens, and you continue on through Theologia, the god's stronghold, you get separated from Almira and Leon, and towards the middle of Chapter 9, Gollum showed up to help us out instead of Leon. But yeah, you aren't just restricted to playing as Feel for the whole game. Once you get through Chapter 12, you'll be able to play as either Almira or Leon from the main menu, and while it's a nice feature, all of the characters play very similarly, with some minor differences. Devil May Cry, by the time of the Sword of Ateria's release, had only four playable characters. Dante, Lucia, Trish, and Virgil, with the special edition re-release of DMC3. Plus there's also, later on at least, Nero, a fully realized Trish, Lady, and V, a grand total of seven playable characters across the games. The Sword of Ateria, as it turns out, has a grand total of eight playable characters with their own unique attack pattern and special attacks. However, unlike DMC, where each character can feel distinct in how they play, including having different moves and alternate playstyles, the Sword of Ateria's cast is relatively similar. Granted, I'm playing on a file with all the character stats maxed out to level 8, but the main difference that you'll notice is that each basic combo is different, the speed at which their attacks come off are either faster or slower, and their special attack at level 1 is just their special attack at level 2, but on a slightly smaller scale. Basically, there's very little difference, and you'll only notice it if you really pay attention. Then there's the fact that the effort required to get these playable characters is more of a hassle than it's worth, since you not only need to play the game multiple times, doing different things in each playthrough, you also need to collect the game's hidden collectible, Wisdom Fragments. There are 20 sprinkled across almost every level of the game, and you need to collect all 20 to unlock the game's bonus content. Getting every single character requires at least two playthroughs, while unlocking the game's extra modes can be done on one playthrough if you either follow a guide or are super meticulous about checking everything. Then there's also the two bonus chapters that you can get only upon a second playthrough, after doing some specific things. To get the important story bonus chapter, you need to play through the game a second time until you beat chapter 16. After doing that, the game will present you with the main menu screen as normal, but you'll have question marks in the corner of the screen. This bonus chapter, titled Cain, is a chapter that fills in gaps that are left after the prologue. You end up playing as Vetus, with Juju and Gollum as backup, and you run through three arenas with your armor, while the Overzenith theme plays. And after getting through every single enemy, Vetus and Cain meet up and the two have some dialogue, which explains what happened to him after his disappearance at the end of the prologue. Plus, it also revealed why Vetus wasn't shell-shocked after finally losing to the party in Chapter 15, and heavily hinting at Feel and possibly Dorothy's origins. 
Sadly, if you only do one playthrough, you'll think that all the stuff that's brought up in this chapter with Kane and Vetus are just plot holes that the devs left in, which isn't actually the case. I admittedly don't understand why this chapter had to be a bonus one. I understand for the other bonus chapter we're about to discuss, but this is like crucial story elements. Why would you put this in a bonus chapter that some people might not even experience? Meanwhile, on the lighter end of the spectrum, the other bonus chapter is... well... Oz Rangers, the Slayer Squad! Yeah, it's a Power Rangers slash Super Sentai parody level. To unlock this chapter, you need to beat the game once and get an item called the Muffler of Justice. However, you need to play through the game again, and on this second playthrough, complete Chapter 8 with the Muffler of Justice equipped. Once you see the question marks, you'll get treated to a lighthearted little romp where Feel wakes up in what's presumed to be modern day Japan, and the monsters have all been turned into Saturday morning cartoon villains, while Feel, Almira, and Leon are the red, blue, and yellow rangers respectively, including the transformations, the costumes, and even the freaking music. Plus, Leon and Almira's personalities have changed, and it's honestly amazing. Huh? Where am I? You finally awake? Did you enjoy your nap? Huh? Good morning, Feel. You've been asleep quite a while. Yeah, you kind of overslept. It's past lunchtime, you know. What? Almira, Leon? Oh, you've got some hair sticking up. What a mess. Come on, I'll fix it for you. Hold still now. Huh? Oh. Um, Almira? Hmm, I'm jealous. Why don't you fix my hair next? Not for you. With your hairstyle, who can tell if you've got some sticking up or not? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> The best part about all of this is that it's probably my favorite chapter in the game since it's purely a training ground to practice characters and their quirks in an enclosed arena with easy enemies to style on and get over zeniths. It's so out there and hilarious that I can't help but love it. Though, these two bonus chapters are marred by one tiny frustration that I have. And that's the fact that these chapters have voice acting while the main game does not. It sucks, since the voice work is of a high quality, and not missing a single link or messy performance in the cast. So it's either a time limitation or a budgetary limitation. And I would've gotten a lot more invested with the game if there were fully voiced dialogue moments like the ones in these bonus chapters, but sadly we didn't get that and all we got are these in-engine cutscenes. Now we're still not done, since there's two extra modes to quickly discuss. Henchman mode is unlocked after acquiring 15 Wisdom Fragments, where you play a spoof level as the enemies of this game, trying to take down the party's evil clones that you fight in Chapter 9. As funny as this is, it's not exactly a fun chapter to play, since you'll be getting juggled quite often. It did take me one try to beat it, but it's still not exactly fun. And the second is Dorothy's Adventure, where you play as Dorothy with Toto as a party member, wrecking every enemy that gets in your way because good lord Dorothy is so strong it's unfair. She's the equivalent of Virgil in DMC5 for this game. So OP that she's separated from the others, and doesn't even have access to a full level 3 over Zenith. As amazing as this game can be when the stars align, I don't think it's worth it to play through the campaign multiple times just so you can experience everything the game has to offer. Which is why, if you're interested in trying out this flawed experience after this video, I'm going to give you the same advice Seabit did in his video. Play through the game once, get whatever ending you get, though do try and go for the good ending or the true ending, since those are the only decent ones, then after you beat it, download the save file Seabit put on GameFAQs and import it into PCSX2 or a modded PS2 and experience the content that way. The Sword of Ateria is janky, somewhat unfinished, and broken in many places. But when the stars align, it's a great experience. 
and ultimately, it's an inspired and unique game that scratched my itch enough to tide me over for the time being. I recommend trying it out, since its cast, art design, interesting world, and soundtrack have elevated the Sword of Ateria into yet another classic that I never got to experience growing up. And I hope that Konami either takes some of the ideas that were put in this game, and try and make another Devil May Cry-like game, since the genre can never have enough entries. <laughs>